or in gather time afterwards, that's, that's fine. We make a, a smooth transition because our next uh, speaker is, uh, is uh, talking to the same more or less uh, uh, topic. We have Michael Richardson coming up. Michael, feel free to share your screen uh, with the topic of writing standards that matter to the public. Uh, hello. Is it working? Good. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, hi. So, I'm here to talk a bit about what I do and what I care about standards. And uh, a little, just a little overview of the talk. It didn't work out the way I hoped it would. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit who I am. There's a bunch of logos of things I've done. I've basically been working in this since the 80s when I was a teenager. And I noticed that a lot of the people in the room are, are seem to be a lot younger than me, but maybe not all. Um, and what do I do? Mostly I write ITF RFCs. Uh, most of them have something to do with security um, and they've become IoT things. Um, and I've managed to find companies that are willing to pay me to do this work, which is kind of amazing in some level. Um, there's a lot of standards, a lot of things get written by very big companies. Um, and uh, I don't have to kind of do, have quite such the same attachment uh, to their uh, mandate, uh, even if I'm, uh, uh, involved in getting them to pay me as an expert. Um, I, I really like implementing standards. Uh, I like to implement them. You may have heard the IETF motto, which is we believe in running code and rough consensus. And it used to be that we said it the other way and people realized, no, no, we really want running code first and we want rough consensus on the standard afterwards. Um, and I sometimes get asked to review documents and sometimes they're references to uh, ISO or IEC or IEEE or ANSI standards. And uh, so I try to, you know, like I want to know, well, what's the history of this? What's behind all of this? And uh, so I go and try to, to uh, get that document off the, uh, off the internet. And this is what I see. Please hand me 198 uh, Swiss francs for a document. Um, recently, there was a document from spdx.org. If you've heard of this uh, executive uh, order in the spring, uh, relating to software and um, uh, bill of materials, the SPDX entity, which has came out of the Linux Foundation, um, decided to go to the IEC to publish their document. Um, and the I IEC ISO was supposed to make it available for free. Uh, six months later, they still haven't done that, but you can go to SPDX and get it directly. Um, but why in the world would that even be there? Why would they even think of it? It's complete nonsense to me um, what there. Um, and, and as you, this previous talker was speaking, I went and looked it up just for the hell, hell of it and discovered, yes, you can buy the JPEG 2000 spec for $198, uh, 198 Swiss francs, um, which is probably close to 300 Canadian dollars anyway. Um, and, and I just want a little pick a little knit here, okay? For all that money, do you see that there's question marks at the front of each of the bullet points? Why is that? Oh, that's because those guys couldn't actually follow the standard for fonts on the internet. And they used a Microsoft Windows specific font and it renders as a question mark because it doesn't load. So for 198 Swiss francs, you can't even get the document in a uh, advertised in a standard format from a standards organization. So I think this is like, the hugest waste of time and energy. And uh, I, as the, some of the previous speakers said, I actually think this, this ought to contravene international law. And so that's what the talk I wanted to give you. I wanted to tell you how all this stuff should be illegal and should be whatever. So I went and read the UN Charter of Rights. And I was expecting to find that it said somewhere in there um, you know, how people have a right to food and all sorts of other things like this, that somewhere in there, it said that people have the right to be able to read their laws. And I failed to find it. And I talked to some people in, in, in a number of other are areas. And I said, I'm sorry, did, am I just missing this? What's going on? Like, is this like, I just not reading the right document or something like this or, or whatever? Surely we have the right to read our own laws. So being a Canadian, I went and read the Canadian Charter of Rights. And uh, discovered it didn't say anything either. And I thought this was amazing, okay? And I, I read further and discovered that none of our laws seemed to be really clearly written down. And I thought, because I watched TV as a kid, and if you haven't seen the, the, the Schoolhouse Rock videos from the 1970s and 1980s, I strongly urge you to visit, you know, your local archive, archive of them. Um, 
And the best one, of course, was I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And it told us all about how laws were made in the US. And, and it was wonderful because it taught us something as a kid. And, and somehow along that process, you would have thought that that law would be written down and available. And I just assumed that Canada would be the same way and other places would be the same way and that this would be a tenant of the UN. Um, so uh, so that, as I said, I came back and said, okay, well, surely it's in the Canadian constitution, right? We did this whole thing in Canada. You probably don't know if you weren't a Canadian, but when I was a kid, it was a major thing in 1982. We repatriated our constitution. We no longer had to go to the British parliament to change stuff. And what did I learn? I found there was no obligation to publish anything. Um, there wasn't even an obligation to publish the Hansard, which is the record of who said what in Parliament. Um, what I did find was that if you publish something, you had to publish in both official languages, which is great. But there was no obligation to actually do anything. Now, in Canada, we have Crown Copyright, and in a number of other Commonwealth countries, they have this. In the United States, they have don't. They have a, a very strange other thing. So. I wound up finding this paper from 1999 and I've linked it here. And it's very interesting because it talks about well, the requirements in different jurisdictions and particularly Canada to publish laws online. And, you know, he makes this as an as introduction, which I quoted here, that a secret law is an oxymoron. If it's secret, it can't be a law, can it? Because, I mean, how could you say that ignorance of the law is no excuse if in fact everyone is ignorant of the law? And it sort of makes you wonder like, well, but if they're not publishing it anywhere, if you have to pay sometimes a lot of money to get a, the law, then how can you avoid being ignorant of all the laws? You may not even just know, you may not know what the latest law is because no one's, no one's actually, you haven't thought to pay money to download it again that way. So um, the paper goes on and actually this comes full circle in some ways. Um, so one of the leaders in publishing laws in the 1990s was the Cornell University Legal Information Institute. And they originally put this up on this thing called Gopher, which if you are under the age of, I would say 40 or maybe 50, my age, uh, you probably never heard of. But they tried to get them on the World Wide Web, but there was no browser that ran on Windows 3 at the time. And they created this thing called Cello. And I remember using it. I remember installing it. I remember doing stuff at the time. I never knew that that was created by the law institute, this legal information institute, specifically so that laws in the US could be in fact published in a browser. And it's kind of interesting, you come full circle like all of this. So the first browser for a commodity platform, not a Sun workstation or something, was designed specifically so that you could read law, the law online. That's kind of shocking to realize and we're now back at this point. In the process, I, just asking and talking to people, I discovered this book published in 1991. And I actually really would, would urge you to, to go take a look. I'm not finished it, actually. I'm about halfway through it. It's a, it has, you know, nice chapters in a, uh, uh, in, in a, um, about a three or four page distance, uh, uh, sorry, length. It's perfectly good for, you know, reading in the bathroom. Um, and so there you go. Um, and this guy named Carl Malamud basically was asked to put the ITU documents online back in 1991, before the web, before Gopher mostly. Um, and it's archived on archive.org. Um, there's a photo from the front cover. I actually bought a paper copy of it. Um, and uh, last, it's not, it's not been, uh, at least archive.org doesn't have it um, digitally scanned. So I actually typed this in um, earlier today. So I just popped apologize for the typos. Um, so basically they asked him to put their stuff online and he went and did that. And then after 90 days, they discovered that this actually might be popular and people were actually downloading their stuff and using it. And we can't have that. We can't have people actually knowing anything. And I think that tells you all. And as far as I can see, the ITU has not changed at all in, in the last 30 years. Um, and if you really want an interesting uh, technological journey. Um, he wrote this book as the report to them as to, you know, what, what, how the project went. And he really just travels around the world and he learns about how people are using technology and what standards they're using and what standards they're not using. And 
uh, all this kind of stuff. It's quite fascinating to, to me uh, uh, there. And there are names in it which are still active. There are people there that are mentioned who are still active on the, in the IETF and still active in, a, in, a, in, uh, on the, in the world. They're, they're, they're not dead yet. It's not old, they're not, they're not done. So um, one of the, so the view I came back with in the end of things is that I wanted to talk to you and tell you about how it should be the case that if laws are public, by law, if by law, laws are have to be public, and if those laws mention standards, which they do, for instance, building codes, then it should be the case that all of the standards should be public uh, there. And we should all be, have access to them. There should be no, no issue about, you know, having to pay to download them. And um, this is not the case in Canada, and it's not the case internationally. In fact, I will even tell you that about 10 years ago, the Standards Council of Canada, which is a government institution that's supposed to promote standards, sent everyone a paper flyer telling us how we could use um, Adobe products to apply digital rights management to our standards documents so no one could copy them. And I was just flabbergasted at this. I'm like, really? So you're promoting a specific product to do digital rights management on a document that's supposed to be free and you work for the government? And this is terrible. So as I said, it's not the case in Canada. It seems to be the case in the US. Um, and California has a fairly extensive, for instance, uh, mandate to publish uh, laws online. Um, Australia, according to this 20 year old paper was doing very well. And I hope more places are doing well. The question is whether or not this is actually connecting to the standards and, and to the documents that are going with them. Imagine if there was a law that said that archivists had to uh, archive in a particular format. Um, if so, you'd expect that all of the documents would be available uh, for free um, there. So my last parting thing, this is the last slide, is I, I was interested in that last thing because as you may know, I am involved in the seller effort. I'm the co-chair. Um, I don't write code and I don't write the documents. I just try to get them through to the standards process. So my advice, if you are an archivist out there, please join us on the seller working group and uh, forget this JPEG 2000 stuff. You don't want that. that. It's, not, uh, it's not good. That's it for me. Questions? Thank you so much with this uh, um, call to action to, to end the conference with, uh, Michael. That's excellent. Thank you. Can I see some hands in the chat for everybody uh, who's now been urged on to, to join the seller working group? Come on, I'm people. I'm trying to read the, the background on, people. here. People posting questions or were they questions or? I, uh, for now, for now, I've seen mostly, mostly comments. Uh, none of them disguise as questions or vice versa. Um, so it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Um, and, and a lot of people clapping, of course. So thank you for that for that wonderful uh, presentation. I think the chat especially erupted in laughter at the moment where you showed the, the ISO page not adhering to its own, uh, to its own the standards is selling. So um, Ashley, Ashley is asking, I think this, this one is a, a, a good one to pick up on. What's, what's the work? What's left to do in Stellar? Aren't, aren't you guys done yet? Yeah, aren't we done yet? So um, so the FLAC document um, specifically was asked for about, um, we had no lead, uh, uh, lead uh, author uh, to work on it for um, at least two years, I would say. Um, uh, and then, uh, Martin, Mar I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher, Martin van Boden um, has stepped up and seems to be working on it. In the process, realized that the original document uh, was under uh, a copyright which was not compatible with the IETF. Uh, the IETF, unfortunately, uh, has a, un a, a, a copyright that they put on documents, which is designed to keep the document intact. Um, and in G7 countries, that would be done with a trademark, right? And the IETF would actually say, you know what? Anyone can copy the document for any purpose whatsoever. If you modify it, well, then it's not the original document. You can't give it by the same name, right? And that's, that's what a trademark does. Unfortunately, um, some 
50 or 80 countries in the world uh, who, while they're signatories to the Berne Convention on Copyright, do not have any kind of a trademark mechanism. And so we can't preserve them, uh, the intactness of that document once it's published in those countries, why trademark? And it has to be done by copyright. And the end result is that uh, there are certain copyrights, uh, uh, the GNU, for instance, documentation copyright turns out to be incompatible with the IETF copyright. And it's a real stupid thing. Uh, anyway, so we, we finally tracked down the original author of the original document and he gave us permission to relicense it. So that's really good. And what we really need in the FLAC space is we need reviews. We need people to read it. Uh, we need people to uh, come onto our mailing lists, onto our monthly meetings, which are last Tuesday and the, uh, in the month, last fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, and we use open um, source uh, web um, uh, conferencing to talk. Come to our GitHub, um, make comments, um, propose changes to the text, um, but mostly we need people to read it um, and tell us whether or not, you know, I'm sure there's awkward sentences where you like could make three different versions of it, but you don't know what, what it is. So ask us, please. Um, as Jerome says in the thing, uh, Matroska is uh, in its, it's supposed but to have been finished already. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think I, I think Jerome was uh, responding to Ashley's further uh, uh, question um, that I won't butcher this time, uh, which about the next steps. I think so. Jerome, I think Jerome was 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 responding to the next steps that you guys are looking at. Yeah. So as I said, we need more review. Matroska is needs uh, uh, more review. Uh, I expect that we will get that published uh, into the RFC editor queue sometime in the winter or very early spring. Um, and then um, it'll get reviewed. We published FFB1, the legacy document. Um, so that's everything that's already out there. Um, and the IETF doesn't have change control over that. And then we have FFB1 version four, um, which is going to probably take more than a year. And the IETF will have change control over that document. Um, and it will be an IETF standard. Um, but to a certain extent, we don't know what you need. Okay, there's still an open question. Well, what else should we add that's there? And what do you need to have standardized? So there we, there's where we really need people who are trying to use the document, trying to use the spec and to basically um, there. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I think one, one question that I would like to ask is you've, you've been involved with a number of, of IDF projects and I was, I was wondering whether you, whether you could comment Maybe the dynamics of seller, how do, how they compare to other standardization efforts, um, or maybe even just the way how how speedy the process is going. Um, so so, I mean, there's ITF uh, working groups that are large, several hundred people, um, often with uh, a wide variety of viewpoints from all of the big tech that you can imagine, small tech um, people who just you know run networks in rural Australia or something like this. Um, the ITF is very much a uh, just come as you are. We come as individuals, um, and we do, we try to to work together and you know achieve some kind of rough consensus. Um, the seller working group, by contrast, is small, but a dozen people. Um, there's about seventy people on the mailing list. Um, you know, so thirty or forty of them I've never heard from. They've never said anything. They maybe maybe they're filing it into a a mailbox they never read or something like this. Um, you can read it all anonymously if you want. We have a public mail archives. You can read it by IMAP if you prefer to do that. Um, and um, generally there's a flurry of activity in the week before our, our uh, Tuesday meeting. Um, so we don't have a Tuesday meeting in November, but we will have one in January, which is probably, I could tell you when that is. It's probably the 18th. No, it's the 25th of January. Um, and uh, I would say it's a pretty comfortable, welcoming group of people. Um, and whereas other groups have a lot of presentations and a lot of, you know, posturing, uh, I would say that we just gather and we try to get work through the issues. Um, I share the GitHub issue tracker at times, and we try to figure out 
you know, in real time, how we can resolve the issues that have come up uh, and finish that. I saw a question from Dave Rice, yeah. which I'd like yeah, to Dave. answer. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll you'll put answer the it. question in first. Okay. I'll put the question in. So the question was, if, if one organization needs or, or says that it needs that amount of money for their standards to, to maintain the organization, how, how, does, how is IETF funded? Um, sometimes on a shoestring. Um, we have historically, um, prior to about five or six years ago, uh, we've had three meetings a year. Um, and um, I was on the finance subcommittee at one point and effectively from 1986 when we started until about 2012, 2013, um, the IETF essentially had three meetings a year um, and each meeting made a profit of about a half a million dollars. And that one and a half million dollars was spent on the rest of the publication process and people, the behind the scenes stuff. And so historically it was driven by the physical meetings, uh, the, the fees, and of course companies paid fees to attend we always let people, um, and we still do let people attend remotely for free, um, even far be even before the pandemic, um, that was a thing. Um, then we started having sponsorships as, as there were some gaps that came into play. Um, and we asked you know, companies to sign on for $100,000 a year kind of sponsorships. And many of them do this, most of them are, yes, big tech. Um, and they don't seem to have a lot of influence as to things go, they just get a banner up there um and but now what's happened is that um most of the funding from the itf comes from our parent entity which is the internet society and they have basically rather than becoming a being a, a regular kind of sponsor who who took care of our deficits if there were any they are now up front saying this is how much money they're putting in and as you know they run org and they have a, a, a other sponsors that come into them. Um, and so they have a reasonable amount of money at this point. And the ITF is one of their major activities that they, they spend money on. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There's one more question. Um, and I'm going to maybe ask the chat to quiet down a little bit. This is getting heated in there about non-related uh, uh, topic or related topics. But so let's maybe take those to the, the gather town and please adhere to the, to the code of conduct uh, that we have for the conference. Um, uh, there was one question from, from Lorena about setting up how, what you do when you want to introduce or, or work on a new standard. And I think that's also some one, one for the gather town, but thanks for the question. And thank you uh, to all the panelists for the, from this afternoon uh, for your wonderful inspiration and talk, talks and energy. So a clap from the audience. Um, and I hereby am going to hand over to Mr. Dave Rice, who is intending to wrap this puppy up. Sure. Um, thanks everyone for coming to No Time to Wait. Uh, I guess for the closing, often what we do in person is we open it up to kind of closing comments from the community. But first, I want to kind of acknowledge the <clears throat> the members of the organizing committee that are here. Uh, we have Alessandra, Valeria, Rasa is here, I think, and Jerome. <clears throat> um, I guess this, I mean, just to speak from my own experience, it was a lot of kind of quick.